Welcome back to Reasonable Faith with Dr. William Lane Craig. Thank you. We're looking at a YouTube video from an atheist who is criticizing the Reasonable Faith animated video on the resurrection. That'd be my video. Ding, ding. Round two. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. In particular, this is part of a series of back and forths between myself and well-known Christian apologist Dr. William Lane Craig. This conversation is going to continue past today's episode, so if you're new to the channel, you should tap on the subscribe button now so that you'll be notified when the next rounds are posted. To set the context, this is my response to the second part of Dr. Craig's response to my response of his original video. Like in part one, due to length, repetition, and response inception, I'm going to occasionally summarize what has gone on before instead of using all the clip history, but all the prior videos are linked in the description so you can check my accuracy. Ready to go? We'll pick it up where we left off last time. Straight to talking about the arguments, no time spent talking about each other. Perfect. Good improvement. And here's where we are in the Reasonable Faith video. With my observation that from the first written gospel to the last written gospel, the miracles and divine attributes of Jesus seem to grow with each telling, like might happen with a developing legend. The fact that we are dealing here with multiple, independent, and extremely early sources for the burial and empty tomb of Jesus shows that we are not dealing here with legend. I'm curious. How does multiple sources protect against legend? Legends develop precisely when multiple people start repeating stories, with each narrator embellishing them with their own flair, building on the last telling. See King Arthur, Paul Bunyan, or alien abductions. Part 1 of this series spoke at length about Craig's complete failure to establish source independence, so we won't recover that ground here. But, link in the description. Back in the 1930s and the 40s, in the heyday of... Uh, positivism. Uh, many New Testament scholars did regard the empty tomb story as a late legendary development. Craig keeps shifting the goalpost, first from legendary development, now qualifying to late legendary development, arguing that timing of a claim somehow affects the truth of the claim. I would love for Craig or any apologist to research, or address the existing literature, on minimum time requirements for a legend to spread. Even with modern fact-checking, legends can grow in mere days and weeks. They don't require decades. And that view now has been decisively overthrown on the basis of things like the discovery that Paul is quoting a pre-Pauline formula that goes back to within the first five years of Jesus' death. Craig is talking about the infamous 1 Corinthians 15 passage where Paul seems to be reciting an earlier created creed that aggressive apologists assert could date to within five years of Jesus' death. But this estimate is based entirely on plausibility with a sprinkling of hopes and wishes. But far more important than the dating, again, this creed makes absolutely no mention whatsoever of a tomb, and thereby cannot attest to a tomb no matter when it was created. The pre-Mark and Passion story, which is an extremely early source. Most Christians don't like to think about the fact that Mark wasn't an eyewitness and was instead merely writing down traditions that became common in the community. So kudos to Craig here for acknowledging this reality. But his extremely early characterization of this hypothetical source is based even less on evidence and more on what he wants to be true than that 1 Corinthians creed we just spoke about was. Everything about this is speculative since we don't actually have any pre markan text. The um, empty tomb narratives are not late accruing legends. Rather, they are there from the very beginning. The Pauline letters are the earliest written books of the New Testament, and none of them mention an empty tomb. The first tomb attestation is the Book of Mark, written several decades after the events. 30 to 40 years feels like a long time for embellishments to accumulate, don't you think? This high Christology that we find in yeah. John. That's again an old chestnut that has now been, I think, um, largely invalidated. I don't know how one invalidates observations. I didn't invent the phrase high Christology. The phenomenon was so obvious to Christian theologians that they came up with their own name for it. You might argue the observation is ultimately unimportant for some reason, but the observation is still there for all to see. The high Christology is to be found right in Mark, right in the earliest of the Gospels. Um, John uh, involves a high Christology, yes, but it's not one that isn't found in the other gospel. In the book of Mark, Jesus is called the Son of God, did just a few smaller miracles, and was elusive if people attempted to call him the Messiah. But by the time John was written decades later, 
Jesus is co-creating the universe, raising other people from the dead, and announcing himself as God everywhere he went. When Superman was first created in 1938, he was stronger than steel, faster than a train, and could leap tall buildings in a single bound. By the 1960s, Superman was invulnerable to anything that wasn't kryptonite, could travel so fast that it would reverse time, and could actually fly, even to space. Sure, there are recognizable seeds of what both Jesus and Superman would eventually become in the early works, but that doesn't change the fact that the powers grew over time. Wouldn't we expect a development uh, in the later sources of, uh, of even inspiration, I mean, uh, from a theological standpoint? Of I suppose, and certainly there's nothing wrong with later authors reflecting more deeply theologically on what they've come to believe. That's a huge admission. If the entire Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, why would later written books have deeper theology than earlier written ones? And since we're talking specifically about the Gospels, books that Craig insist are of a historical genre recording historical facts, why would a developing theology come into play at all? Yet, this is what we undeniably observe. What we're looking at principally now is the fact of the empty tomb. Mm -hmm. And some people have noticed that John's account of the empty tomb is arguably the most primitive, the most simple and, and unembellished. If by simple and unembellished you mean the fewest flowery adjectives, then maybe. But the author of John is merely more efficient with word count. It still has the tombstone rolled away, two angels, the maximum number of angels, keeps the cameo of main character Peter that was introduced in the Gospel of Luke, and introduces the resurrected Jesus himself into the scene, something none of the others did. If someone is arguing Joannian simplicity, they're not on solid ground. This is, in fact, one of the remarkable things about the empty tomb stories, is how uncolored they are by theological and apologetical motifs. They are the, the resurrection of Jesus is not narrated. There's no proof text from prophecy. This is interesting. So according to William Lane Craig, passages that do carry theological motifs and are accompanied by prophecy proof texts are less likely to be historical. Like the birth narratives, John the Baptist, Jesus' temptation, the triumphal entry, Jesus predicting his death, casting lots for his clothes, piercing his side, and so on and so on and so on. All of those passages colored by theological motif and Old Testament proof texts are less likely to be historical? I fully agree. There's no description of the risen Lord. Except there is in John. The version you think might be least embellished? That the women simply come to the tomb and find it empty. And that's all. The cross it, doesn't come out and speak. No, no, exactly. <laughs> you know? As in later legends like yeah. the Apocryphal Gospel of mm -hmm. Peter. If you want to see the way a legendary account of the empty tomb looks, look at the later Apocryphal Gospels, which arose in the second half of the second century after Christ and later. I'm not sure why Dr. Craig would mention the later Apocryphal Gospels. If you could somehow plot legendary development on a graph, these Apocryphal Gospels help to show the upward trend that starts with Mark. Hurts his case. And there you do have these sorts of features like the resurrection of Jesus itself being witnessed by a crowd of hostile witnesses and the Roman guard and, and all the rest. And, and by contrast, the empty tomb story in the Gospels is stark in its simplicity, which speaks to its historical credibility. Craig admits that there were early church writers who felt free to embellish the story of Jesus with non-historical elements. On what basis could Craig possibly be confident that while the Gospel of Peter contained legendary development, somehow the Gospel of John did not? Okay, continuing with the video. When an event is recorded by two or more unconnected sources, historians' confidence that the event actually happened increases. But since the alleged sources for the empty tomb aren't sources at all, and are most certainly not unconnected, shouldn't that arrow point downward as we lower our confidence? No. Even on his own account, he hasn't shown that these aren't sources at all. Craig makes a good point here. I used imprecise language when I said these aren't sources at all. The Corinthians and Acts passages don't mention the tomb at all, so I don't consider those texts to be tomb sources, nor should anyone. The other passages do mention the tomb, so it would be sources of sorts. I should have said some of these sources aren't sources. I, I think it's worth making the point for our listeners that the so-called criteria of authenticity cannot be used negatively to dispute the historicity of a saying or event in the life of Jesus, which is what he tries to do here. If a narrative is not dissimilar, not embarrassing, not independently attested, that doesn't decrease one's confidence that it's historical. It, it leaves it an open question. That's fair, and another artifact of imprecise language on my part. 
what I was trying to say is that many Christians, like my former self, erroneously believe that the sources for the empty tomb are independent in the way Craig attests, and are therefore operating at an unwarranted increased confidence. For such people, like me, when they come to learn the truth that these sources are indeed highly dependent on each other, they should correspondingly lower this mistakenly increased confidence, back down to a neutral level of open question, as Craig suggests. The uh, critic here does not understand how the criteria of authenticity are to be properly used. Continuing. Moreover, the Gospels indicate that it was women who first discovered that Jesus' body was missing. The Gospels indicate, or, or the Bible tells me so. Again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with looking at these earliest sources for the life of Jesus and finding that they record that it was women who discovered Jesus to empty. Just as there's nothing wrong with me reminding everyone that there are no historical sources outside of the Bible for this claim, for the Bible tells me so. Does he seem to be penalizing the New Testament documents here? Yes, clearly. That, that's clearly right. He's, he's prejudiced against it and so characterize it by saying the Bible tells me so. What is even remotely prejudiced about merely pointing out the fact that your only source for this claim is the Bible? That is an extremely accurate observation. Recently, people started getting excited about buzz that J.J. Abrams will be directing the next Superman movie. Something I'm skeptical of because, at least at the time of this recording, the single solitary source for this idea is a website called Cosmic Book News. Now, does it make me prejudice against Cosmic Book News if I point out that it's the only source for this J.J. Superman story? Or am I merely someone who prefers confirmation before I accept a claim as fact? Which just shows he doesn't understand how New Testament historians work. I mean, can you imagine approaching the writings of Tacitus or Suetonius and saying, yes, Tacitus tells me so, <laughs> Suetonius tells me so. <laughs> That's pretty great. Let's hear that again. Yes, Tacitus tells me so, <laughs> Suetonius tells me so. You, yeah. you know, they don't have something. their own song. <laughs> they don't have their own song. Why is that? Why is it that the Bible needs a song to implant in children the idea of the Bible's historical accuracy, but other historical sources are left to be judged on their own merit without a reassuring melody? Yeah, <laughs> no. no one would do such <laughs> yeah. a thing. And, and similarly with respect to the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Luke, um, you, 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 you approach this as you would any other source for ancient events. Well, that's right. And with any source, one apportions confidence relative to the evidence available. When Tacitus or Suetonius are the only sources for something, historians apportion their confidence. No one is getting preferential treatment here. Continuing. Craig's video argued that because... In that culture, a woman's testimony was considered next to worthless. That if the Jesus story were invented, men would have discovered the tomb. I clarified that this testimony bias applied to court situations only, but when it came to religious life of their community, women were highly persuasive in winning converts and leading the early church. The discovery of the tomb by women is one of the features that has been most persuasive uh, to modern scholars in coming to regard the empty tomb as a historical fact. The critic here simply doesn't appreciate how uh, countercultural uh, this is. Uh, women, as he admits, um, were not regarded as reliable witnesses. Women were not regarded as reliable witnesses in a court of law. But people don't change religions because of court cases. They change because of someone influential in their life. And women were just as relationally influential then as they are now. Case in point, the woman Jesus talks to by Jacob's well in John chapter 4. After they talk, the woman is said to have returned to her town and... Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. This one woman converted many people because of her testimony. She had one conversation with Jesus, and her testimony swayed many. The Bible itself refutes Craig's idea about women's testimony. I don't know what he's talking about when he says that women were prominent in the early church. Acts speaks of Priscilla, who seemed to hold influence in the church equal or greater than her husband. The author of 2 Timothy reminds the recipient that his scripture teachers were his mother Eunice and grandmother Lois. The author of Philippians speaks of a congregation-wide rift caused by a feud between two women, Eodia and Syntyche. 1 Timothy describes how women are leading the church in hospitality, service, and helping those in need. Houses of women are being used as meeting places like Lydia in Acts. According to Romans, a woman named Phoebe was a benefactor to Paul and many others. There are more named and unnamed in the Bible and also affirmed in early church writings. That's what I'm talking about, Dr. Craig. 
My video went on to explain that because it was the job of women to tend the bodies, any invented story that wanted to sound realistic would have had to have had women discovering the tomb. For the same narrative reason, crime dramas have early morning joggers discover bodies in the park, or maid service discovering problems in hotel rooms. That's who we would expect to be first on scene. And the idea that they were first on the scene because this is what women did is, again, I think, just simply historically false. He presents the women's visit to the tomb as though this were the sort of normal thing that women would do. The Tractate Semirot is our oldest known rabbinic text that sets forth detailed Jewish laws concerning death, burial, and mourning. While it makes allowances for men to prepare the body of men, it was generally the job of women to prepare everyone. In John 12, Jesus speaks openly to his disciples about a day when Martha's sister Mary might anoint his dead body. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. And none of the men in the room objected to this, arguing with Jesus to insist that they would have to be the ones doing the anointing. No, it wasn't a task for men. Everyone in that room, including the disciples, expected women to do it. But rather than take my word for it, let's hear from another best-selling Christian apologist, Pastor Tim Keller, in a clip suggested by fellow former Mennonite Doug at Pine Creek. But it was quite a nasty thing to have to do. Uh, the, there was a, it was a cadaver, it was a, it was a, it was a dead body, it, it probably stank, it might have, uh, it certainly was incredibly unpleasant. And so who did it? Slaves and women. Men? Respectable men never did anything like this. Go, you, go look it up in your commentaries. It's a startling thing. Certainly men could come uh, to the tomb to remember their departed friend. Who would these have been? All the men who were closest to Jesus, his 12 disciples, had fled and gone into hiding afraid of reprisal, according to the gospel story. The next chapter couldn't have them proudly heading to the tomb at the earliest opportunity where they were bound to get caught. Again, from a narrative perspective, this would make no sense. So I think he just fails to appreciate how really countercultural these narratives are in making female disciples discover the empty tomb of Jesus rather than having this done by men like Peter and John. Undisputed history tells us that in first century Jewish custom, tending to the body was a woman's role. So the narrative rings true only if it's women. The Bible itself tells us that women's testimony was winning converts to Christianity. It may not have counted in court, but their word counted at the community well. I think it's Craig who fails to appreciate the cultural context here. This is already getting along, and I'm supposed to be on my vacation. So since that's all the women talk, let's pick it up there next time for the maybe final chapter in the Apologia vs. William Lane Craig Empty Tomb Smackdown. We've got soldiers, zombies, and Germans coming up, which sounds a little like the plot to Indiana Jones 5. Subscribe now so you don't miss it. Later. Later.